Okay. Am I sharing yet? No, I don't think so. Okay. okay. So why don't you just crash ahead? Uh, <laughs> no for New Jersey welcomes everybody. So thank you everyone for coming and um, over to Aisha. Great, thanks. So I'm so excited to be here with NOFA New Jersey um, and excited talking about mushrooms. And I thought, you know, with NOFA, you know, hopefully I'm talking to a good number of farmers. So I uh, thought I'd talk about, you know, how to make some money with mushrooms. And as you can see, you're making enough money to maybe get a Toyota Camry that's at the back there, but it's probably not going to be a uh, you know, a big, a big selling uh, real estate kind of uh, promo here. I got my iPad. <laughs> so I'm Aisha, I'm with Noble Mushroom, and that's my husband. Um, so what I'm hoping to cover, and oops, I'm sorry, it's jumping ahead for me. I'm gonna move this aside a second, okay. What I'm hoping to cover and hoping that you get today from this is some extra interest in mushrooms and interest in adding mushrooms to your um, to your farm offerings, either through your CSA or whatever your outlets are that you get to your customers. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of co cover everything in kind of three main buckets, if you will. You know why mushrooms. Um, about some mushrooms that we cultivate and some options for you um, on your farm. What? <clears throat> so start us off, we're gonna do a little poll. Thanks to Josefina. Have you gr ever grown mushrooms? Josephine, you're on mute, but you let me know when you've got some results. Sharing them now. Okay, so we have a few people, about a third have done some kind of mushroom growth. So that's good, some mixed hands on. Um, and so most of you want it. So, okay, let's get going then. So, for 2020, the American Mushroom Institute said that mushrooms was the biggest trend. And yes, it could be a biased view from the American Mushroom Institute, but I think it's at least one of the biggest food trends that's been coming. And I'm hearing it from it about it from other people telling me that, oh, you know, they read this about mushrooms or they saw this in the newspaper about mushrooms. So I, I do think it's certainly catching on and there's a lot of interest in the public um, maybe even more so because of COVID. Uh, so right now, the world production of mushroom is kind of divvied up into these species that I'll talk about. The, the one two that's the biggest is the Lent, and I'm really bad with my Latin name, so forgive me if anyone else knows. Uh, so it's the Lentinula, which is really shiitake mushrooms. And so that's 20%, 22% of the market right now. Um, maybe what you're more familiar with is the button mushroom, and that's the agaricus, and that's about 15%. And then you've got two other large groups, which is um, pleurotus, which is the oysters, and the last one is the woodier mushrooms. And then you've got some other smaller varieties. So what's all the hype about? I have this little video that shows you that it's not just the American Institute, but a mushroom institute, but it's a on time magazine too. Is the audio okay? It's good. It's just a minute long. No calories. Lots of goodies. And they taste good too. Good vitamin D source.
So I do not recommend raw mushrooms to anyone. So I know that there's always raw mushrooms at the salad bar, but uh, you really can't get any nutrition out of a raw mushroom because of the way the cell walls of the mushroom are so, so tough. So really cooking enhances both the flavor as well as the nutrients you get from mushroom. And a small population will also have a, an adverse reaction. If they eat too much, um, they'll have some digestive issues with raw mushroom. Oh, sure. <laughs> So there's some other micronutrients and I don't really, or, you know, overplay the medicinal properties, but, you know, it's good to know that, you know, and a lot of people are getting aware of um, compounds like beta glucans and polyphenols, which are uh, known to be beneficial to your body and really hard to get elsewhere. Um, Anti-cancer, antiviral, um, antibacterial, you know, certain mushrooms are also known to be really good for your brain as well as your heart. Oops. So, okay. so lots of good, good, good news with mushrooms and, you know, good ways to then promote mushrooms if you're, um, if you're looking to add that to your uh, diet or to uh, your customer's diet. So these are the cultivated mushrooms that, um, you know, you may see fairly often and most of the ones that we um, cultivate locally here. So shiitake, so that's, a, you know, what shiitakes look like. Um, the oysters, uh, lion's mane is the one that I mentioned has good uh, medicinal properties for the brain. Um, and then some of the ones at the bottom are ones that I'm more recently started adding to our uh, varieties. I did want to talk a little bit about button mushrooms since that's kind of like the bigger player in the mushroom world is the button mushrooms. There's the white button, cremini, as well as portobello. They're all part of what they call that agaricus species and they're very similar um, in properties and how they grow. The, the biggest difference between button mushrooms and why I don't do button mushrooms, I choose these other ones, is that button mushrooms grow on compost and mostly on um, animal uh, manure compost. So I've had people, you know, ask me, oh, how come mushrooms, my mushrooms look so clean? Well, I grow on a wood substrate. So we're only dealing with primary decomposers. Um, so they're directly, you know, breaking down mush, um, the wood uh, substrate, mostly hardwood. So, you know, so we don't have uh, uh, any animal waste related. It's a, it's a fairly clean process and never really looks you know, soiled, so to speak, unless you grow it outside. So I just kind of want to, you know, kind of want to walk through these mushrooms. Oh, going back to our production, um, this is another growth trend that graph on shiitake. So shiitake is, you know, being the biggest uh, mushroom uh, produced in the world. You can see even since like as early as 1990, I mean, growth has just like skyrocketed. And it, I think this is, this is a trend we're going to see with all the mushroom. Um, obviously, China is a lead in producer, followed by Japan. Europe's another, it's, it's right there as well. Uh, and then the US. So these are our mushrooms. Hey, so we didn't really sure. clarify. Do you want to take questions as we go? Or do you want to just wait until the end? I'll take questions as we go. I yeah, I was curious, um, how long do you think um, mushrooms sit on the shelf or travel from their producers if it's not a local producer? Do you have any idea? Because they it look depends. so different when you buy them in the store. Yeah, it depends. It depends on the mushroom. So uh, button mushrooms and um, even the shiitakes have really good shelf life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, shiitakes can keep two to three weeks, probably buttons even longer. Um, these oysters, though, very short shelf life. You know, if it's a week, if it's a good, good week, mm -hmm. um, it's usually, you know, three or four days. They, they kind of, even if they don't, um, even if they're still edible after a week, they just don't look very nice. And they kind of look, uh, you know, broken down and people, it'll be harder to, to purchase, uh, to mm -hmm. sell those. 
Um, so that's, that's one reason I think why there's such a good market for growing oyster mushrooms and some of these specialty mushrooms locally, because you don't then have to compete with what's in the grocery store, because I've seen these in the grocery stores, um, like, you know, and uh, without naming names, you know, and sometimes they're, they're looking pretty sad. You know, they, they are some grocery stores who are now doing this in, in, in house growing. So that, that obviously makes a difference if you can get it closer because uh, shipping, you know, they do suffer in shipping. Right, thank you. Sure. So for oyster mushrooms, there's there's a lot, there's a lot probably more variety than this, but you know, these are the three good basic ones that we grow: the blue oyster, the pink oyster, and the golden oyster. Um, and probably the golden is the most delicate, most brittle, falls apart like you know, at as soon as pretty much as soon as you harvest it. It's, so it's quite delicate. You have to be quite careful with it. The pinks are probably the sturdiest, very meaty. You even need to cook them longer to get them crispy. Um, and then the blues are a nice all around button, uh, you know, button replacement mushroom, I should call it, say. And then some other popular oysters, uh, same family, but very different looking is the king oyster, which is very popular, dense, meaty mushroom, a really good meat substitute. People make like fake scallops or fake uh, bacon out of it. It just tastes really good. Just even as a mushroom, not fake anything. And then the black pearl is actually a Japanese hybrid. And it's a hybrid between the king oyster and the blue oyster. And really it's, I think, I mean, it's a nice nice one for farmers because the king oyster can be a little difficult to grow. And so the black pearl is a nice way of um, kind of meeting that demand for a, a, a mushroom that's you know fully edible, the stem is edible, everything's edible and meaty as well. And then chestnut mushrooms. This is by far one of the most popular in the farmer's market circuit, uh, both for myself as well as the other farmers I work with. Um, just always just flies off the shelf. It's got this really pretty speckled uh, golden color, um, just attracts people's attention. Very, very meaty, um, mushroomy, deep flavor. You can eat the stems um, that are hollow, so they add a little texture to a stir fry. And then the lion's mane is one that people are getting to know fairly well because of the brain benefits and um, the research being do done with Alzheimer's um, and you know the benefits for you know brain. And it tastes like, kind of like crab. It's got mild. It's mild. It's not very strong, but it's you know it's got a crab lobster flavor as well as a crab lobster texture. And so people will do fake crab cakes, lobster bisque type recipes. So it's a really interesting and, you know, all the kids love to like come and pet it like it's a little cat or something. Um, and then some of the varieties that I really enjoy is the white beech and the brown beech, the same family. We usually more, more grow the white beech, you know, we've got enough brown mushrooms and they don't really taste significantly different. Um, it's got a nutty flavor, less so than an umami flavor that uh, mushrooms are known for. Uh, tastes really good roasted or sauteed with butter or oil. Um, has a crunch when you cook it. So for uh, people who tell me that their spouse has some mushroom, um, you know, adverse reaction to this texture of mushrooms, I'll recommend the beach mushroom because it's, you know, it stays firm, it gets crunchy, so it's not that soft um, mushroom texture. Um, and the piopinos. Another favorite, uh, actually a favorite with Italian. So it's called the poor man's porcini because it has that slightly porky flavor. Um, just a really nice one for risottos and just, just to eat on its own. And then some of the newer ones we've started adding, um, inokis. Inokis have just a big, big umami flavor. And if you recall in that uh, circle, it actually was 10% of the world production. Uh, my friends from China tell me that really for them, shiitake and inoki are like, you know, the basics of mushroom um, cuisine for them. Uh, so, you know, this is one of the rare ones that you don't, that doesn't like too much light and, if, and doesn't even like too much air. Uh, you can see the caps get a little larger and less inoki, typical inoki looking from the market. Um, 
but they still taste good, no matter what the color. And then, then the Mikos are, a, they also call the butterscotch, butterscotch. They kind of taste butterscotch. So butterscotch mushroom, a little bit cashew flavor is what I get when I cook them. And then the maitake or hen of the woods, it's the same mushroom, really popular, um, you know, really flavorful, nutty, meaty, you know, like everything put together, really good texture also. And this uh, flemionila, that's the, that, that's the enoki. So that's 11%. And we'll do a little quick, quick poll. In the US, market share of the button mushrooms, acaricus. And I put this here so you knew the world was at 15%. But the US, different market, what do you think? So waiting on a few people? Yep, two more people, or just one unless one of the people are you, Aisha. <laughs> Maybe they stepped away. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So the correct answer, surprisingly, and some of you did get it, it's that one third that grew the mushrooms already. It's 95%. I mean, it is like by far the most eaten mushroom in uh, the US. And most of it grown right outside New Jersey in Pennsylvania, Kenneth Square has probably some of the largest mushroom farms, but also California is right behind them. Um, so if you imagine, again, you know, from, from a marketing perspective, 95% of the mushrooms eaten are already um, button mushrooms. There's really no point, you know, make, you know, growing those mushrooms and getting to the scale that you need to, to get it to compete price-wise with a supermarket would be quite, quite an investment. So it's nice to focus on these other ones that are not yet as popular in the US, um, like, you know, I think personally, I would say I, I like to focus on the pleuro, pleurotus uh, oyster group and, you know, build that up. And I feel like, you know, obviously between 5%, if, if you assume the rest of that 5% was oyster, even to 19% of market share, there's a lot of growth area right there. So let's talk time. That is like everyone's number one commodity, right? How much time do you have? How much time can you spare if you're farming already? Probably, probably not too much. Probably, probably you're pretty busy, especially right now, you know, with spring, everyone's sort of getting started. So I kind of wanted to give you options in terms of what you could start maybe now, what you could look to in the future and build up to. Um, so starting at retail, you know, if you're just buying mushrooms from other New Jersey farmers uh, to resale at your farm, you know, that's that's pretty low, low time investment, uh, moderate risk, you know, uh, to try and sell those mushrooms. But, you know, your your farmer is going to help you uh, make the, that sale. Um, foraging, again, it's spring. So mushroom season in the forest is starting. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, even though that's not my area of expertise. I know a little bit enough to be dangerous. Um, outdoor installations are great. They uh, take a it's more kind of like a sporadic time. It takes a lot of time up front to kind of set it up, and then you just kind of leave it for a good year, and then you kind of harvest as you go. So less, uh, you know, sort of less consistent times expended. And then you can grow your mushroom blocks, which is what Noble Mushroom does, and you know that that's going to to do it at any sort of relatively consistent level. You're going to take a little bit of time, live quite a bit of um, in upfront investment, but it could be, could be your thing, could be worth your while. So let's talk about retailing first. This is the easy one, right? But I think this, this is a net benefit to a lot of people. Um, you know, have a phone call with, you know, whoever your local uh, mushroom farmers are. And they're certainly 
a growing number of uh, them in New Jersey, and I'd be happy to connect you guys. Um, expose exposes your customer to you know some new something new and exciting that might excite them. And I think it, this really is where the local farmer helps. And certainly since I've been doing this, I think our fifth years now for mushroom farming, we've seen that as we educate people, we're getting more people interested and they're spreading the word. So I think there's just more customers to draw into this. Um, you're not really drawing away from anyone. You're just drawing in new customers. And then it's a good way to test the market. Just, you know, put some mushrooms, talk to some people, give it a little time and, you know, you can see, is that work for you? Maybe in your area, maybe just doesn't. And then you've, you know, you don't have to put in the time and effort to do, to do more. Uh, but more than likely you will see that, you know, you can test it and have a good idea. And then of course it helps the mushroom farmer and increases local capacity. So we have more local foods and this became important even during COVID where we saw, you know, certain things got, became rarer to find. So it's nice to have a nice source of, something fresh like mushrooms um, through the winter as well. And then, you know, you have mushroom farmer and you can work out cross promotions and it's a net benefit to everyone, including the community, I think. So let me move on to foraging. Foraging is basically, oh, that's, oops. Okay, got to go back. Foraging is basically going into the forest, finding mostly the forest, I'll say, finding some mushrooms that you know um, are edible and you know consuming those or having other people consume them. So I guess our, my full question is how many people have foraged, which means not just picking the mushroom, but also eating it. Aisha, while we have this poll question going, Jared asked, um, is there any difference in your opinion from wild versus cultivated, um, cultivated mushrooms from the woods or hen of the woods? Yes, I think there is. I think it's a big, big difference, actually. I think in general, the forage, it's hard to re replicate nature. It's really, you know, it just tastes better coming from the woods. Um, but it's it's not it's not that cultivated mushrooms don't taste good. They taste good. It's just it's it's almost like it's a different mushroom. There's like a much more intense flavor, much more complexity um, in the wild mushroom, uh, particularly for hen of the woods. Even size wise, if you've ever seen hen of the woods in the wild, it's like bigger than my head. Um, and then typically in cultivation, they'll grow smaller, much smaller. I'll be ending the poll to show. There you go. Yay. Okay, so quite a few, you know, that's not, that's more than I expected. Quite a lot of you are, are foraging, which is great. It's not an advertisement, but um, we do have a foraging uh, session scheduled for June. Um, yeah, so we have uh, Tama Matsuoka Wang and she um, forages at um, the Watershed Institute. Um, so she, she'll be taking people on a walking tour of the Watershed Institute and she'll oh. show you what she forages. So um, check it out online and uh, sign up. Yeah, and actually I'll make another plug. So the New Jersey Mycological Association is a great organization, very cheap to join. They have forays. And I think they're going to start this year doing some uh, small in-person forays. Um, and they'll, you know, they, their experts are beyond though the edible. They are just experts in wild mushrooms. So they, they're like my new heroes. I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn more mushrooms, not just the edible ones, uh, thanks to their inspiration. So this was me probably on my first foray. Um, this was at the New Jersey Audubon Hoffman, Sher Sherman Hoffman Center in Bernards, I think it's in Bernardsville. And I was so excited. I thought it was chanterelles. 
I found, but uh, it's not. <laughs> it's uh, the jack-o'-lantern, not an edible, in fact, quite poisonous. So, but it was pretty, <laughs> so it was fun. Um, so it is a lot of fun. And I think, you know, that's even the, with the mycological association, even if it just gets you a little started and you go out with your little field book, don't know what, half of what you're looking at. It's just fun to suddenly find, find new things in the forest. Um, so it's a low, low investment on money. Obviously, it's just your time. And you, you control that. You, can, you decide how much time you want to spend out in the forest and the woods, you know, which is not a bad time to, but bad way to spend your time. It is, I, I really do think that foraged um, mushrooms are really high quality. They can just certainly are some of our higher, higher priced mushrooms, um, you know, need to be valued. I think it's really important with foragers to know that, um, you know, taking the mushroom is like taking, taking an apple off a tree. You're not really hurting the, the mushroom organism as such. Um, it's, 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 still, it's still going to reproduce. I think they've shown that even if you clear out a whole forest, the next year, the, the diversity of mushrooms will remain. Um, you know, they're very resilient in that way. What, what, what's not that resilient are that there's a lot of animals and specifically insects that do eat um, mushrooms also. So, I, you know, we, we try to leave a little bit behind for the bugs um, and you'll certainly find bugs when you, you pick up any uh, forage mushrooms. So if, if you're queasy at all, don't probably, don't be surprised when you find a whole bunch of things crawling out of your mushrooms. Um, but you know, let's let's leave a little bit for them. If you've ever Googled online, uh, you know, foraging, there's, there's, they call it the foolproof four, specifically for the Northeast. Um, you know, four that are easy to identify, hard to mistake for a different mushroom, and you know, you should certainly do more research than I'm giving you. But I'm just going to get you started, and I've added a two two more of my favorites um, into the list. So morels are the famous ones, right? Everyone wants a morel. And that season is right now, right? Right now through probably mid-May is morel season for New Jersey, is the early spring. Um, there's certainly been a decline in the morels um, being found in New Jersey. I haven't found any. Someone else had given me these a um, few years ago. But the reason really is that um, it's, it's the ash tree that you know the decline of the ash tree uh, which is was is an associated with this mushroom um, has declined and overall that's really the biggest trouble for uh, wild mushrooms is habitat is um, if we conserve habitat we'll conserve the wild mushrooms and we can forage more and appreciate them more uh, but it's really development that's that's the biggest hazard to to mushrooms in, uh, and foraging in the in the wild so the giant puffballs, another one. This one to me is easy to find, easy to identify. They're come in all sorts of sizes from, um, you know, big watermelon size to smaller ones. There's one that's kind of shaped a little more, um, like I think they call it the skull puffball, a little more like a mushroom shape, but it's still got that puffball um, characteristic. As long as you cut it and it's white inside, it's safe to eat in New Jersey. If it's discolored or black, it's a no-go on those. Um, but it's kind of one of those mushrooms that I don't really, um, I don't really care for, and I don't really sell that much. It's kind of like the tofu of mushrooms. I call it. You know, it's, it doesn't taste like anything. It's kind of mo most of the time you cut it, and it's it starts going yellow, which means it's sporing, which means it's spoiling, so you don't want to eat it. So I, you know, if I'm selling it and then someone, you know, goes home and cuts it and it's yellow, you know, that's such a disappointment for them. So I don't want to do that. So it's kind of a, it's an, it's an okay mushroom for me. I, I'll leave that one for the bugs. One of my favorite, well, I'm going to say that a lot. So I better stop saying that already. So <laughs> chicken of the woods, one of, one of my customers' favorites for sure. This is by far a very popular mushroom, chicken of the woods. Taste and texture just like chicken. So a lot of vegetarians, a lot of vegans like this mushroom. Um, I will say, and I always warn uh, my customers, there is a, there is a small population of uh, 
people who are allergic to the chicken of the woods uh, mushroom. So they, you know, they do need to just taste a small amount and make sure they're feeling okay before they eat like a huge meal of it. And also with all mushrooms, but specifically this one, because of the texture is so uh, dense and dry, cook it through all the way, make sure you cook it through. Otherwise you will, you will have some digestive issues. Then this is my husband sniffing a chanterelle. And you might ask, why is he sh sniffing it? It's because it smells amazing. It's the best smell on earth, honestly. It smells like almost like an apricot, but with a little mushroom in it. It just smells fresh and you know delicious. You just know it's going to taste good. Um, kind of tastes more like pork though. Pork kind of has a texture of pork fat. Uh, so really meaty flavor. One of, I think Europe's most popular mushroom is probably the chanterelle. I get a lot of Polish, Russians, Swedish people just like flocking for the chanterelles. And that's a summer mushroom. Oh, I should have said for the chicken of the woods, it's, it's actually, a, last year was a very long uh, season. You'll tend to see chicken of the woods pretty much from early summer all the way into fall. Um, very fairly common uh, mushroom. Chanterelle is kind of deep, deep uh, into summer season. You know, August um, is really, they, they like it hot, they like it wet. So that's the chanterelle. And then my two add-ons to the foolproof four is have Hen of the Woods, which is the maitake. You can see the size here. I mean, it's just enormous. And that's probably not the biggest specimen I've seen. Um, and you'll break it and there'll be all sorts of critters coming out. So you're just gonna have to deal with it. And once you taste it, you don't even mind because um, it tastes so good. And then the black trumpets are the small um, mushroom, kind of a little similar to a chanterelle, but even smaller, hard to see, very thin skinned, comes out around the same time as a chanterelle. Um, a little hard to see because they're black. So, you know, sometimes in the woods, it's, it's a matter of getting your eyes accustomed to it, but really smoky flavor. You don't need a lot. Um, just need a little bit when you just have it. Most people just have it with, you know, pasta and uh, butter or uh, just a little bit on a white bread because you don't want to kind of, you don't want to adulterate it too much because it just tastes good, good on its own and you want to just get its full flavor. Kind of some people call it like a cigar, cigar kind of smokiness. Question, um, Aisha, from Christy. Yeah. What is, in general, the best time of the year for foraging? Depends on species. So and it depends on what you're looking for. So uh, for me, I would say chanterelles are my sort of favorite to forage for. So I'm going to say summer. Of course, that's the when it's the most uncomfortable. That's when the mosquitoes are out and the ticks might be there too. So it's give and take. And then the fall is nice too, because that's when the, oh, I didn't mention for the um, maitake, it's, it's strictly a fall mushroom. So, um, so that's, the, that's a good time. So it's, it's kind of nice with foraging, you kind of have a season and you can follow it pretty much from spring into uh, fall. Um, winter, the only thing I know that in this area, people will find woodier mushrooms which for whatever reason is just really not popular and not popular in farmers markets. I've never, never had anyone ask me for it, uh, even though it's, it's fairly eaten, fairly large scale in uh, Asia. Any other questions? Um, no, you're fine. Okay. I'm gonna stop my video as I fix my hair a little bit. So outdoor installations, I'm going to talk about that next. Um, and this is, this is kind of a fun, I would say flavor wise, it's foraging, outdoor installation, and then unfortunately the ones I do my, and love, and my homegrown uh, indoor uh, mushrooms. But I think you need to advance the slides. Oh. For some reason it went all the way back. Oh, there we go. Oh. Now you're on question four. Let's do a little um, poll. So when do you think, and I would guess that outdoor installation is how mushroom cultivation started. So when do you think humans first started cultivating mushrooms for food? I guess I should answer too.
Is everyone guessing or anyone knows? Mm -hmm. Waiting for a few more people. It's all anonymous. Oh, look, you guys got it. <laughs> it is 600 BCE. So it was the Chinese and that's the first evidence we have of uh, mushrooms being cultivated. So it's, they've certainly been popular and with us for a while. And this is how I think would, they would have started, is with an outdoor installation. Shiitake mushrooms on logs are probably the most popular outdoor installation. And I think those shiitakes taste, again, far superior, far different from regular shiitakes, just more complexity, more meatiness, um, more woodsiness uh, in them. And then totems, which is the photo I have uh, on the right here, is another way of doing logs. It's usually with a broader diameter um, and they usually seem to do it for oysters and lion's mane. And you're kind of just sandwiching the spawn between two slices of, uh, of the wood, wood log. Um, and then you can also do wood chip beds or other material beds, um, kind of like a vegetable bed. And wine caps is one I've done, which is you know just a lot of fun. Um, it's pretty easy to do. It helps soil. So it's always good when you see mushrooms in your soil. Um, they have a good beneficial impact on um, insect life as well as your plants. And a great reference for uh, all outdoor items is the Cornell um, University. They have a lot of material and I put this link in here. Um, so it's really, they really have taken it uh, a step further, particularly for shiitakes. Um, and in terms of vendors, probably Field and Forest out of uh, Wisconsin are the most well known. You know, they're very helpful. Um, I've spoken to them on the phone and they'll, they'll kind of walk you through the steps to, to setting up outdoor installations. Um, it's not something, it's something I'd like to be more into. I don't have too much space to do outdoor, but, you know, I certainly appreciate it. And I work with farmers who do have outdoor installations and I will often buy from them to, to sell at market because uh, I know how valuable they are. I actually think that they're very undervalued. And you know, if I see them going for cheap, I'll usually buy everything because I know I can probably sell it for more because it's just, and of course I'll eat it too, I'll eat it all. <laughs> So this is what the shiitake logs or bolts look like. You kind of drill holes into um, um, usually oak or maple. This is, I'll show you a table uh, of the woods. Um, you, you drill holes all, all over. Uh, you let it sit for about a year. So I'm hearing six months now for some. Then you can either just allow it to fruit naturally based on what the temperature and, and rain is doing, or you can force it by putting it into cold water. It forces the uh, fruit to uh, start pinning and you get these beautiful, you know, little flowery looking shiitakes. And these logs will continue producing for years. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's hard work to get all those logs uh, inoculated, but once you have them, there you have it. And this, these photographs are from uh, Wolfgast tree, tree Farm and Apiary in Somerset, New Jersey. And, you know, and they've been doing this for years, I think like more than 20 years. So, you know, Kathy's really, really got her stuff down here. And this is a table from the Field and Forest um, website. And, you know, you can see it's not just shiitakes, lion's mane, oyster. You can grow a, a fair number of mushrooms uh, on logs, and it's all these different types of um, tree species. So if you, if you happen to be having, have to take down a tree, as long as it's not already rotted out, um, and usually that you want to cut it during the, um, you know, after the leaves fall in fall and before they start uh, budding out in spring. So that's like their ideal window. But, you know, even if you get something in summer, hey, you got a cherry tree, why not just try it? try putting some Namiko on it and see how it goes. It'd be kind of a fun project to do. Mushroom beds. So 
the wine caps I did, you know, this is the method I used where, you know, you kind of just layer it, cardboard, wood chips, straw, put some spawn in and you'd kind of do this lasagna thing. And you just kind of let it go. And, you know, I did it in the fall and spring, I had some mushrooms and this is what they look like. And you can see I'm, I've got weeds everywhere. So, you know, they blend it right in and you do have to look for them. Sometimes they'll be under the leaves and stuff and they, they'll pop up and they've got this wine wine kind of cabernet colored cap as it gets older and as it gets more sun it gets bigger and um browner but you really want to ca catch it when it's small that's when it's you know the tastes the best um they kind of compare it to a, a potato uh, what do they call it mashed potato mashed potato flavor um so it's you know, it's kind of a fun one. I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily one to try and uh, grow to, you know, capitalize on the mushroom market. It's it's not the easiest to sell because it's so unfamiliar and you only have it for like a short time of, you know, a week or so. Uh, but it's really so much fun. It's like foraging in your own backyard. So it, it, it's really a lot of fun. And it helps all the all your plants do so much better. Two other ones that I'm experimenting with right now, I haven't grown them before. I got a, a bluet, a wild bluet from um, a friend of mine down south in Vineland. So we cultured that up and we're gonna try putting that on some uh, organic material in the fall and we'll see how that does. And if you've ever seen the bluet, it's a really purpley, uh, purpley colored mushroom. So it looks kind of crazy, but it is edible, um, but I've never eaten it myself as yet. Um, and then this is one button mushroom that I am going to try because no one seems to grow it on a commercial scale, even though it's really very interesting. It's called the almond acaricus. Uh, so it is a button mushroom, smells kind of like almond, but it's supposed to have some really good nutritional uh, quality. So I'm going to try it out and I'll report back. And that's what I have for outdoor installations before I continue on you know, the stuff I do know best about. Um, anyone want to have any questions? I think I can see the chat. Yes. So one question is about what you grow. Kristen asked, do you, do you grow tremella mushrooms? Can I see that one? Is it, are you talking about the, um, oops, the, Turkey tail mushroom that's used for medicinal use. Trumella, I'm not. Feel free to unmute Kristen. I think it's a tropical mushroom. So I've heard. Um, it's, I know it's used in teas, and I've seen a couple teas that actually use tremella. Oh. I'm going to look it up when we do the. Um, do a little quiz and I'll look that up. Ah, okay. So Jared in the chat says that he thinks it's also called the snow fungus. Yeah, right. he's right. I told you it's bad with Latin. <laughs> That's right. It is the snow fungus. And we we don't grow it right now. We've talked about it. It's on our list of potential. Oh, um, great. They're like jelly. It's like jelly. It almost got like chewy texture, right? If you've had. I've never had it. That's interesting. Do you eat it as an egg? That good, Jared. <laughs> if, if I'm if I'm thinking if I'm thinking of what I've had, I've had it in like a soup or like a dashi kind of thing. Yeah. And it almost like it's almost got like the woodier kind of chewiness and like um, yeah, waviness. Looking like waviness, like coral, like edible coral. But, but you're right, it's supposed to have some very good medicinal qualities. Um, I think it's called the snow fungus because it likes it cold. So okay, maybe sometime in the winter we can <laughs> look at it. Maybe we're always doing experiments. So I'll, I'll put that one down on, 
<laughs> to research. And it's a good question because, you know, uh, I mean, it's perfect with my poll question because how many mushrooms are there? Uh, it's... Thank you. <laughs> so you're close, but not exactly right for the 50%. Twin, two to three million. That's how many mushrooms they think are are you know in existence. That's about the number of mushroom estimated. Um, but the ones that we actually know and have described and identified is only one hundred and twenty thousand. So, so I grow ten. We've and maybe I know another ten, and you know I've I've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> I think we. Humanity has a lot of work to do still. So it's a it's a fascinating. I think that's one of the reasons I started growing mushrooms is I started learning about it and I realized how little I knew about it. And then now I'm realizing how little everyone else knows about it too. It's very, very fun to do some research. Okay. So hope I don't lose too many of you now because I'm going to get a little oops into my element and I'm told that it can get a little boring. <laughs> but so this is this is what we do. That's one of our oyster blocks growing, and I brought one in here too. See myself. So that's you know that's basically how we grow our mushrooms and sell these blocks to other farmers to grow mushrooms. Um, and it's a five pound bag of um, the mushroom sort of plant, if you will, or root. And you cut the bag open and give it the right conditions and you will get your mushroom fruit. Um, so those are the terms that we use in terms of fruiting uh, the mushroom versus if you, when I'm just in the bag, I'm just running the mycelium. So, you know, I did say it was kind of on the top of my list with time and money, but it is scalable. You can start small and then decide to kind of make it more, more complex. And you probably should, because you, you want to kind of learn a little bit about it and, and learn about um, just like you would with plants, right? Or animals, you know, learn what it takes to make uh, a good mushroom. Uh, but it's going to, as a farmer, give you more control, right? You're going to have more mushrooms uh, throughout the year consistently and different varieties to offer versus if you're just foraging, then it's seasonal. This week, you may only have chanterelles. Next week, you may not have anything. So it's going to be, give you a little more consistency and more variety. Um, and you can purchase those blocks. That's what I sell to other farmers as well. You can also make them yourself. Um, there's a, actually this was from Tony at Martinet, gave me a sample uh, photograph of his um, homemade uh, bucket. And you know, he used straw and it's certainly doable. Uh, and most of us start with buckets actually. So did we did that too for a long time. Um, I was always concerned with the amount of plastic with mushroom growing in this indoor way. So for a long time, we've been using the biodegradable plastic bags from Unicorn. They degrade to nothing, not to microplastics. They degrade to you know, their elements. Um, so for the most part, we use them once in a while, uh, our manufacturer cannot supply. And then we have to have, we have a backup with the, the regular plastic. Um, so that's unfortunate, but we're working on it. Uh, so what's in these bags and in the bucket, it's mostly for us, it's sawdust. In the buckets, it's usually straw and maybe a mixture of straw and sawdust. There's a lot of water, probably 50% water. And then there's some kind of nitrogen supplement. And it's either uh, soybean hulls is a very popular one, cotton seed hulls, some kind of grain bran, alfalfa is also used. Um, and then you've got the spawn itself. It's the grain spawn is usually just the same white mycelium that's in the block, just around grain, usually wheat or millet uh, are very common. And you, you just, they're the way you kind of seed, seed the sawdust and they jump off onto that um, bag. 
And then once that whole uh, mycelium is drawn, which means your bag is kind of white with mycelium, then you're ready to fruit. And I'm going to show you some fruiting options. So just to kind of sort of tell you what I'm not going to talk about today, because I think it's just a whole nother dis topic of discussion, is kind of getting to that mycelium uh, bag and the grain spawn and the whole, all the steps. It's a lot of lab work. It's actually uh, quite interesting if you like kind of more sciencey, but it's, it's a lot of sterile work. Um, you know, pasteurization. So it's it's a whole nother thing. And, you know, my husband does that part mostly. So it can get a little repetitive, but it's it's interesting stuff. But I'm going to talk about once you have a, a block, um, what, what you do with it to get your fruit out of it. And there's a couple of options for fruiting room. And I've certainly tried most of them. Uh, so one is our hoop house. We, we set up a hoop house under some trees. Um, specifically for mushrooms on a farm. And, you know, we put this tarp over it to kind of control uh, light getting in. But really the issue with light is more the heat. So we're trying to keep the temperatures cooler. So we put this tarp over it. And I don't know whose photo this is. <laughs> I didn't get a good reference, but you know, it, this is not the way I had set it up, but you know, it's something like that. You know, you, you have all your blocks in there and you open them up and you have misters in there to, to help with humidity. And you kind of just let them, you know, go with the seasons. And, you know, if it's hot, you choose a mushroom that likes it hot. And if it's cooler, you use the mushroom that likes it cooler. Um, so I'll, I'll talk more about the conditions um, mushrooms need in a minute, but I just wanted to show you the, the options first. And then this is a nice indoor option. And basically this, what they call the Martha in the industry, which is because it was originally made out of the Martha Stewart closet organizer. I mean, this is basically a small version of what most mushroom farmers have. Um, so it's, it's pretty, you know, it's a pretty good, um, it's a pretty good scale, actually. You could probably get, you know, a good five, five, six pounds a week out of it. Uh, but, you know, it lets you really get to know the mushrooms well. Uh, so let me describe to you what you're seeing here a little bit. On the right, you're seeing a humidifier. And this is just a little, uh, you know, CVS almost humidifier ducted onto some PVC and piped into the, um, this tent at two locations. So you're, pro you're giving them that humid environment. Uh, because you're adding that humidity, you've got a tray at the bottom to collect any condensate. You've got these shelves where you put your blocks and open up your blocks. And then if you can see at the bottom there, they've got a, a hose and that's a vent hose going out. And you do want to make sure that you get those spores you know, away from your house if that's where you're going to do it. Um, you know, we'll usually use an active fan both for in and out air. So, you know, we push it out. You want to push it out as much as you can. So it's away from you. And certainly those spores are very microscopic. So we always, we used to have no problem with this before. We used to have the N95 masks, but then COVID came and, you know, we ran into a little bit of shortage. So we kept reusing them for a while. But, you know, really you do want to have a mask on there so you don't breathe that in because um, they can get into your lungs. But it makes good space. You know, if you've got some space available in your garage, in your basement, a spare room, it's a nice way to, you know, get, get a little familiar with mushrooms and, you know, maybe sell a few. Any questions before I move on on this one? One question we have um, from Keely is where do you where did you say you get the biodegradable bags from? Unicorn. Okay. Unicorn is the manufacturer. And then another one from Christy, would you need to quote unquote repot the blocks to replenish its needs? Say that again? Would you have to repot the block to replenish its needs? No. So we'll go through the conditions to grow the uh, mushrooms, but basically what we give you in the bag and what you want to set up in those buckets is just kind of like a one and done kind of thing. You, you know, it's, it's just going to run its course 
and then uh, it'll give you two or three prudings, sometimes more. And then you know, then you then you can put it out in, the, in your garden, and you might get surprised and get a little more, or put it in your compost, and you might get a, get some more mushrooms there too. But for the most part, you would then take it out. You're not you're not you're not going to try and re repurpose it. And mainly, that's again, we'll talk about some more. It's it's a contamination issue. Um, so if you think of fungi kind of more similar maybe to a bacteria, then you understand that you know bacteria are are going to um, be one of the problems that it faces. So the next step up for me, well, I did the shed thing, but now I'm doing the shipping container thing. And it's basically very much like a photograph, that's it. So it's very much like a hoop house, um, but if you can get some good insulation and if you get some uh, temperature controls in there then you're then you're 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 in a, a much higher level of control of the environment um, and suitability for for the mushrooms um, it, it is indoors so you know you're going to do do what you can to keep it as clean as possible um, okay. This was a plastic one. This is actually not the exact one we used, but similar to this, I got a nice photo online. Um, and you know, it's just easy to pressure wash. You find something, you know, easy ways to to do the cleaning, so you save yourself some time. But that that's a big time uh, part of the mushrooms growing is the cleanliness. Um, and then I would say, you know, you can get the size of blocks, the five block pound blocks. You can probably get three three blocks to about two um, two linear feet of shelving. So, um, you know, you can get in a small space, you can get a fair amount of, of blocks in there. And I just say on average too, if you're doing any crunching any numbers, assume one pound um, of mushroom per block. It can, it is often more than that, especially if you do multiple fruitings, but you know, it's just to be conservative, one pound uh, per block. So if you have like a 10 by six shed, you know, you're, you're, you're cruising, you've got, you know, 10, 40 pounds, depending on the varieties you choose. And you could be, you could be getting um, a bunch of mushrooms, you know, for your market fairly quickly. Um, so let's get into the conditions. So we know how to control these fruiting rooms. So these are the five main things that the mushrooms uh, need to fruit. Um, again, food-wise and uh, water-wise, everything they need is already in that bag. So we're not talking about putting anything more into that bag. It's not, you're not gonna pot it. You're not gonna, you know, not really actually gonna touch it even. You're just going to put a cross or a line or some, some way you're gonna open it. Sometimes you open up the top, top of the bag and you're going to put it into your fruiting room. And you're, these are the five things you're going to uh, give it or control for it to help it uh, give you some nice mushrooms. Any questions before I get in? Thought I heard someone. Nope, you're all good. So mushrooms breathe, they're, they're kind of, more like humans, they're actually in a kingdom of their own, right? There's a fungi kingdom, so they're kind of in between plant and animal, and um, they they don't photosynthesize. They breathe, and sometimes they breathe really heavily. So as you can see, these are my mushrooms, not this middle one. This one right at the end were my one of my early disasters with oyster growing. Um, they will let you know when they are not breathing enough air, if there's not enough oxygen. You need about four to eight room exchanges per hour. Um, these oysters are the most sensitive to the, the carbon dioxide, having high carbon dioxide. So you can put in a monitor that tells you whether you, you know, you're gonna have a problem or not. But if you've got oysters in there, oysters are gonna let you know. They're just gonna get unhappy very, very soon uh, if there's not enough oxygen and they'll get leggy like this one uh, photo um, that I don't have a reference for, or they'll get really corally and, you know, just not looking correct. Um, and if you've got kind of like a, a stack like the Martha or the in the shed, you know, usually how farmers do it um, is the oysters kind of get the top shelf. And that's that's because of the CO2 issue. They really have no tolerance for low CO2 and CO2 tends to sink 
um, it's a heavier gas than oxygen. So it'll be at uh, um, higher concentrations at the bottom. So you're always putting your oysters as high as possible so they can get the most oxygen. Some other varieties are much more forgiving of um, high CO2 and some of them even need high CO2. But even if they need high CO2, they still need oxygen or they will not, they will not be able to um, produce fruit. So again, they don't need watering. So you're not going to water the bag. You're not going to water the mushroom directly, but you're going to provide an environment that's extremely humid. So 80 to 95% humidity is what they, they're pretty much all of them are looking for. There's no mushroom that likes it dry that I can think of. Um, no. So as it warms up, if you're doing this in a hoop house, um, you're going to, you know, add more water as it gets warmer because your relative humidity is going to drop. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a constant battle with airflow and humidity because um, you, you know, you're, you're ventilating, you know, four to eight um, room, room, uh, you know, room exchanges uh, an hour and, and there goes your humidity with that air, right? So you're, you're kind of trying to balance the, that humidity and airflow and there's different ways people do it. We can, you can do it with just a, a, a kind of a, time, a timer and, you know, sort of say, okay, we'll have the fan to ventilate only, you know, five minutes, um, five minutes on and then we'll leave it 15 minutes off and let the humidity build back up. Um, you can have, uh, of course, you can have the CO2 monitors, and in which case you're very high tech and you're kind of controlling everything down to, you know, PPM levels. You can also just set that once you can, get, if you can get fans in and out that, and you can just kind of, you know, balance them out. So it's kind of evens it out, then you can kind of do it, you know, and that's kind of more our style, which is kind of try and balance it out and then, you know, tweak it if the, the oysters start looking funky at all. Um, we've got, we do have a push, um, a sensor push monitor, and it's just a kind of a little square, 50 bucks on Amazon. And I just leave that in my grow room. Actually, I have them everywhere. I must have like 10 of them, uh, you know, temperature and humidity. That's all it reports back. It reports back onto my phone on an app so I can keep track of it. Um, you know, if I'm out for a while and I kind of, or I forget, um, I can check it and I'm like, oh, you know, suddenly you see the curve, there's my humidity gone. I know my reservoir is empty. So go run and get the reservoir filled up. And then there's so many choices on how, and depending on what your setup is, what you might want to use for um, providing that humidity. You can do the drip works, misters, which most farmers have or are very familiar with, right? You just kind of use that water line pressure and you get your, um, hoop house, shed, whatever it is, just, you know, spray it out there as fine an aerosol as possible, just because, you know, you want it more airborne than on your ground. Um, there's also aero misters that sells uh, um, kind of similar misters, but they use a reservoir or you add, have an inline pump, so you get a little more push through those misters. Or you can use um, aqua fog system, which I didn't put a photograph in here. It might not be as familiar to some. It's kind of basically looks like a big industrial fan with a, a water reservoir or a water hosed in. And it, as it blows, it sort of starts vaporizing the water. And those are also very nice for hoop houses. And I think some um, greenhouses use that uh, for plants too. So it kind of cools the air, gives you airflow, as well as gives you the humidification because uh, you're adding that water source. And then probably the one I like the best that I found to be the best from our um, indoor uh, growing is the ultrasonic mister. And we use House of Hydro because it's got a lot of options. And it's kind of, and they, I think they use it for like stage performances, you know, to create fake fog. So it's called a fogger too. And you, it just kind of makes it much, much uh, finer particles of um, water, you know, so it's not much less condensate. I won't say no condensate, less condensate, less cleanup. So it's a nice system. Um, quiet too. And then ideal fruiting temperatures. So if actually if it was ideal, I would have like three or four fruiting rooms and I could keep each one at the ideal temperature for each species. 
and then I would have you know perfect mushrooms all year round. But it's kind of expensive, you know. It's it's you, having that much temperature control, um, you know, can can kind of add up, and having that many fruiting rooms can add up. So you kind of have to take these ideal fruiting temperatures as just what they are. You know, they're ideal. You can kind of stretch it here and there, five, ten degrees. Uh, the mushrooms will let you know when they're done. But you know, you've got the cool, cool weather ones, which are the enoki and the king trumpet. Um, really on the cool side. They do great in the winter. I did really good with them this winter and they're starting to act up right now on me at about, and I'm about 60 right now in my fruiting room. So not, you know, not perfect, but you know, they're still hanging in there. I'm going to see if I can get it out till 65. Blue oysters, this is why we love blue oysters. Most wide range, 50 to 75. Great, let's just do blue oysters. And that's probably the species I would suggest if you're just starting to go with. It's, it's an aggressive um, mushroom, so it fruits well. It doesn't get contaminated. It, it goes quick. It's just like the easiest one. So, you know, it's a good place to start so you don't get frustrated and give up. Lion's mane pupae nose, you know, all the others then start, uh, you know, needing to be a little warmer, but still, still pretty cool. And then when you get into, you know, like more tropical ones, so that's your yellow and pink oysters. Those are like, I mean, I've, I put some pinks in now and I'm at 60 degrees. I'm going to see. My yellows are doing okay, at six, even though this says 65. So, and then I've, but I did, the reason I put my pinks in is because last fall, I grew them all the way into December. So kind of hoping mushrooms, mushrooms want to grow. Mushrooms want to fruit. They want to fruit for you. And then light. Light's, light's a big misconception that mushrooms don't like light. And maybe the button mushrooms, particularly the white button and enoki, they don't really like light. But most mushrooms really do need light. Um, they don't photosynthesize, but you will see a big difference in there, the way they look, the color they are, which you can see a good photo here, which I just took last week. You know, I had a mushroom outside in my vegetable patch from some compost I put out and the one I grew indoor. So in this one, you know, the form looks pretty similar, but the color is clearly very distinct. And they, I mean, it's exactly the same genetics on both these mushrooms. Um, some say this blue light, you know, uh, so if you imagine that mushrooms are living in the forest with all that filtered light through the leaves, so that tends to be, you know, favor the blue wavelength coming through. Um, it, it may be, there may be some small benefit. I, I'm more a white, white light proponent. So I say as full spectrum as you can give them. I don't know all the details of the, and nobody does. So I'm just going to steer towards as, as close to nature as I can in my, you know, pseudo environment. So, and then again, just trying to imitate nature, right? So eight hours on at least, so sometimes it'll be more. Um, and then they, they seem to like that on off cycle. I've read some research that shows that they actually grow faster. Um, that research is mostly on like plates and uh, with the mycelium that they've, though, though that's like almost definitely they prefer uh, having a cycle. Um, so, you know, you try and do the same for the and hope that the, it works for the fruiting, but I haven't really noticed myself. And, you know, how bright does it need to be? It's anywhere from um, 10 to, sorry, 10, 100 to 200 foot candles, which I understand is how bright operating rooms are for surgeries. So, so pretty bright, pretty bright light. Um, not really the dark dungeons and caves. Although it's always easier to add light than uh, take away temperature. So it's always, that's another, another little um, balancing act, especially in the hoop house. And really that's, that's mainly when you don't have that control of temperature, it's really for the, the, um, the light, controlling the light is really for that temperature control because they'll just dry out too quickly uh, your, with your humidity. Even you, your humidity is gonna have a hard time keeping up if it gets too hot. So probably that's the hardest time and that's why do not decide in August that you want to start growing outdoors, um, even indoors, I would say August is not, 
it's a really tough month for most farmers uh, on with mushrooms. It's July, July, August are a really tough month. I have a friend in the, my friend in Vineland, she is just starting to tell me that that's her vacation. She's just going to leave town July, August because mushrooms can't handle it. And then we talked about the vitamin D earlier that, you know, they're one of the few um, plants or vegetables or fungi that give you vitamin D sources of like good source of vitamin D. And they're, they're kind of like humans. It's kind of weird. You know, they, you put them out in the sun. Even if you buy your button mushrooms from um, the grocery store, just leave them out. If, if they are showing gills, gill side up, um, so upside down out in the sun for an hour or so and they, they're extremely rich in vitamin d and they're actually doing that now on purpose in pennsylvania pennsylvania i get these magazines where they're trying to sell you the uv light to help boost your mushrooms um vitamin d content and the last issue is contamination and pest pest control there's some, there's some in every agriculture, right? So we're, we're not immune to this. Uh, green mold, trichoderma, hasiama, something, I don't know, I'm gonna mess it up. Uh, this is the, it's the trike. It's this green mold that you see on these bags here. And these are not our bags. These are bags when we were buying from other people. Um, if we see this, this in our uh, run room, out, it's out right away. Because this stuff is, once it's green like this, it means it's already, it's, it's sporing. That's the skull of the spore. So it's gonna spread quickly and get out into the atmosphere. So we, we kind of get rid of them as quickly as possible. So that, that's probably the number one issue with, uh, with mushrooms and probably the reason why you can only do two or three fruitings from a block indoors is because after that, you're gonna start seeing these strikes start forming where the opening is and you don't want it keep it in your fruiting room. So if it's outside in the compost, that's fine. The mushroom will still fight and win sometimes against it and, and fruit some more, which is great. So there's still enough energy in that block for the mushroom, but you don't want it in your fruiting room because it's just going to make all your other good mushrooms have to work harder and, and probably possibly spoil them. And then a couple of other very specific uh, bugs that seem to like fungi are fungus gnats, which are very annoying little kind of fruit fly thingy majigs. And I just put like fly strips to, to catch them. Um, and this, this bug here in the, uh, that I have a very pretty photograph of, which is called a pleasing beetle. And it loves oyster mushrooms. So you just gotta watch for that. I don't know what you can do. It's mostly a problem in hoop houses. When we had the hoop house, uh, beetles was probably our biggest issue. They eat and you'll see holes, they leave holes in the mushroom. I mean, they, they're kind of otherwise harmless. They don't, they don't stunt growth or anything. You know, They'll hide between the folds of the gills and you just sort of pick them out and have to warn your clients. They might find one sort of hiding in there, but it's, you know, it doesn't do any harm to anyone excepting you know, it kind of eats it a little bit. Um, and there's a joke that we say with oysters, right? They love oysters. So if someone's, if you have an outdoor installation like your mushroom bolts, uh, your shiitake bolts, and you start having a, a beetle problem, well, they said, well, just, just put some oysters, just start growing some oysters because they'll just move from the shiitake all to the oysters because they just want to eat the oysters. They don't care like if they can get oyster. I never see this bug otherwise. The only time I ever see it is on an oyster mushroom. And so cleanliness is just like, it, it's kind of the good and the bad, but you know, it's kind of the, the uh, time consuming part of the uh, mushroom business is you've got to clean, you've got to keep it clean. You know, once you start having um, issues with contamination, and these are just some, there's, there's other issues that, and, you know, similar issues than what you'll find with animal and plants, but these are kind of some specific ones for mushrooms. And, you know, it's that domino effect. Once it kind of gets out of hand, it's just so much more work to try and control things. Um, hydrogen peroxide works really well. Sometimes you got to do bleach if you, if you must. Um, I've heard some people play with UV disinfection. I haven't done that yet. I'm interested in that. So it's, you know, we try and obviously, I, I'm not certified yet. I'm not organic yet. I am working on it, but certainly we, we don't 
we're not uh, using any, and honestly, I wouldn't even know what to use with uh, mushrooms. You know, you just don't want to get anything on there. I don't recommend people eating them raw, but people eat them raw. So I want to make sure there's nothing on my mushrooms that's going to, you know, be dangerous to anyone. And with that, oh, I'm a little behind schedule. I'm sorry, keeping everyone. But um, let's do a quick, quick survey. You've kind of seen a little bit of, a little bit of all the options. What what would you like to learn more about? I certainly know that I didn't probably give you enough information to feel 100% comfortable right off. But you know, maybe you it's something you would now look into a little more and. Um, we can talk a little more and and get you guys started. Aisha, we do have a few questions, so I'll ask them now while this is going. Um, Jared asks, how big is your outdoor operation, either by acreage or quantity of shipping containers? So I'm going, my current fruiting room is very small. It's 10 by 10. I'm going to a shipping container now, uh, which will be 40, I guess. Well, I'll only probably use 30 by eight as my prudent mm -hmm. piece. But in that, I, I mean, to me, that's huge. Like the, just one shipping container, I'm, I'm probably going to have more than a hundred pounds a week. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my goal. Right. And Susan asked the question we all have been wondering, which is which farmer's market do you sell at? I'm at Bedminster Farmer's Market. And also, I guess I, I have to give a shout out to uh, Dogwood Farms. So uh, this winter, they've helped me out a lot. I was wanted to keep growing. I didn't want to shut down. And you know, they've I've I've been selling through through Dogwood Farms. Great. All right, I'll be sharing the last poll now. Let's see it. Here we go. Hey, growing blocks. I thought I was going to put everyone to bed here. Okay, that's exciting. We've got a few. Go ahead. Yeah, we should we should definitely um, think about the next session to get people more involved in the growing of it. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I'm right um, in off Amwell Road in Hillsborough, so I'm certainly also open to you know once we're all back in more sort of personal space yes. we can do something there yes we'll send tony over and do a video <laughs> very good great well i'm excited i'm excited that you guys are excited too yes that's very cool thank you very much for taking the time to do this really appreciate it absolutely please reach out to me i'd love to love talking about mushrooms <laughs> so please <laughs> reach out i'm on instagram at noble mushrooms and i at noblemushrooms.com so i would love to hear from you guys great well thank you very very much everybody for joining us and thank you aisha for teaching us where it's really cool <laughs> thanks and thanks josephina for helping me set up on zoom <laughs> of course it's no problem okay <laughs> Awesome. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.